We're going to chat through a couple of things today. Um, I'm going to discuss some monitoring that we've done on our network of peering and disconnections that we've got across Africa. I'm going to look at why we do peering and dispute some of the conversations that we've already had today. I'm going to look at some of the common problems that we've been seeing in Africa in general. Africa faces different problems to the rest of the world in terms of pairing, and some of them, or many of them, are unique, and some of them are not so unique. I'm going to look at some solutions to those problems related specifically to BDP. It does get a little bit technical, so if you have questions, just stop and ask me, but I'll try to keep it fairly high level. And then just some final discussions on the whole thing. So, who can tell me what's the latency between Johannesburg here and Nairobi in Kenya? Anyone? Okay, Andrew has his hand in at 80 milliseconds. Who else? 60. Okay. 40. 40. Which would be? 300. 300? 400. 400. Okay, so. Alright, so we have all the way from. 40, I think, all the way up to 400. Okay, so from one particular network in South Africa, not my own, to Nairobi, we have 327 to 474 milliseconds and 4% packet loss, roughly, over the last two month period. Okay, I'm not going to tell you this is, it's not really relevant because pretty much everybody is suffering the same struggles. And this is actually a fairly really good latency graph we've got here. This is one of Kenya's bigger players. Some of the smaller players are sitting closer to 900 to 1,000 milliseconds between South Africa and Kenya. I win. <laughs> <laughs> that there is the latency you can get from South Africa to Kenya if you run one of the unsea cables and peer directly. That's significantly better than what the average South African and the average Kenyan are getting when they exchange traffic with each other. I'm going to come back to this at the end, so just keep that number in your head. Okay, just, just a bit of a, a view on BGP on the continent. So this statistic comes from BGP1. There's other guys who refuse, there's other people who collect some of the statistics. Prefixes originated by Egypt. Each, an AS number in each country. There's our top five. Some of those statistics are a bit inflated because guys are doing heavy deaggregation, which obviously is not a good thing. And I'll talk as to why that causes such challenges for us in terms of peering and interconnection a little bit later. But the number of routes we have on the continent is no longer insignificant. In those top five, we already account for more than 2% of the internet routing table. That doesn't sound like a lot, except when you compare it to the amount of participation that we have in the routing table. We, we, we are participating in the global internet in a global way. We don't want to be just sitting at the end of the, at the, end of the undersea cables, considering ourselves to just be consumers. We are the core of our internet in Africa. We need to be engineering our network in Africa to be good for the African, for our African peers. Okay, so we, we, we've heard it from Martin, we've heard it from Will. It's all about saving money. And I'm going to say that it's not. Not for Africa. We, we definitely have a requirement to save money. We definitely need to Improve peering, improving interconnection and peering definitely does save us money. But there are other aspects of our networks in Africa that may be more important than saving $10 per minute. So, some of the other benefits of peering network and internet resilience. Now, in Africa, we've been largely dependent on a very small number of, of, uh, of undersea cables. We've, only two years ago, we were limited to only two that reached all the way to South Africa. For many years before that, we only had one. 
what happens when those samples go down? Now, in theory, if you've got a DNA street server operator to join an exchange, and if you have content in your country, your country can, your, your users on the internet can still do so. They may not be able to get to their most popular sites, but they can still do their email, they can still do, still do their banking. And this is an important thing, and this interconnecting between operators gives us this resilience. If those interconnections do not exist, and we rely entirely on transit connections over undersea cables, when there is an outage, we have no internet on the continent. The interesting thing about this is that when, when peering is done well, with sufficient capacity on the circuits, there are also opportunities that we can help each other out in, in times of need. We, m m many of you may remember some of our challenges in the early months of CECOM going live, and we had some re relatively large operators rerouting their entire international capacity to other operators' objects. Now, we, we, we were talking in the region of over a gigabit per second of traffic, which for Africa is a large amount of traffic. And if we hadn't established prior interconnections at 10 gigabits per second, that would never have been possible. So, these interconnections of exchange points can also be, it could be a commercial arrangement, in this case I don't think it was a commercial arrangement, but there could be commercial arrangements where if there's a failure in a specific location, another one of your peers agrees to change their routing policy for a period, for a fee, etc., etc., but you have the resilience, you have other options. Obviously, going to the capacity issue again, having well-sized pair interconnect and interconnect links gives us the capacity to do other things. I noticed over the last few days on our Jinx traffic graphs, someone has been transferring massive amounts of data. About once every each... Was it you? <laughs> <laughs> About once every two to three hours, we have a gigabit per second spike in our traffic. Now, that, that that's, doesn't, may, may not seem like a lot of traffic, but the fact that there's the ability to do that and the, the circuits are in place and the interconnections are in place, that someone doesn't need to wait three or four days to move the terabytes of data that they need to move, that is a good thing and that provides us with useful things to do with our internet. Obviously the one that I've already spoken about is the latency and performance issue. Africa faces massive latencies. The latencies, I'll, I'll go more into that late, later, but the latencies in Africa are more than what many other parts of the world experience. And in innovation. Now, going back to Martin's presentation, he was talking about flows and how you choose your peers through flows, etc., etc. So, we, we have a peer, well, they weren't a peer, they happen to be co located in the same data center as us. We did the flow analysis on our network, and we realized that we only carried 200 kilobits per second of traffic today. Didn't really seem like much of a point in theory, but it was going to cost us about $150 for a piece of fiber and SFP, so we thought, well, let's just put it in, just in case. Now, today, we still don't exchange more than 2 megabits per second of traffic, of internet traffic, with this particular peer but we now exchange over 60 megabits per second of traffic of other types, like voice interconnection and access networks and all sorts of things like that. At Jinx, we have many, many peers who have come to Jinx to do internet peering and have then gone and done voice peering at the same exchange point because they have the capacity, because they've put, built the infrastructure. And when IPTV starts to come into Africa, we're going to need these big interconnections. We're not going to be bringing IPTV over the other sea cables because that's just not feasible. Okay. So, this, the, the, these are technical issues that we face. Um, the poor latency I've been through quite a bit, the default. Default only routing is a limitation that we have due to 
media that is not having the latest, most extensive hardware. There's a lot of traffic engineering that goes on, and that relates back to the issues of de-aggregation. And then route preference and route leaks are going to a bit more detail just now. So many, many of you will remember this graph, this, this, this map done by Steve Song. And those two latencies there, going from London to the most southern landing point, are the western and the eastern cables. Those latencies are not going to change by more than about 5 or 10 percent as technology improves. No amount of technology is going to reduce that by more than 5 to 10 percent. I often, I often tell people that if they really want latency to come down, they should just pray for continental drift. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not understanding the 160 and 200. What paths are those measuring? Okay, so the 160 goes from London all the way down there to Cape Town, and the 200 is from London all the way down to into Zimbabwe. So basically, from London to the southernmost landing sites. And, and it, it's approximate, but, but it's fairly consistent across all of the different cable systems on the west at about 200, and all of the different cable systems on the east at about so east of 200, west of 160 milliseconds. Best possible scenario. At the moment, yes. The, the challenge on this side is obviously geographic because it has to go around the Horn of Africa and various other things. The challenge on this side is that everybody wants to be a drop off on the cable. If we were to run a cable directly and skip that, we may save 15 20 percent, but it's still not it's still not significant. So the latency thing is physics. The the, the the rule of thumb that I can I can give you a presentation that someone else has presented at Danon, but the rule of thumb is about one millisecond for every hundred kilometers of fiber. That's round trip time. So, once again, continental drift is about the only way you're going to solve that problem. Let's not make it worse with bad routing. So, going back to the, the, the Nairobi example, we've got 400 milliseconds. That's about up the west coast and back down the east. When you're sitting in 800 milliseconds, there's something else that's gone wrong. At the moment, users in Africa are willing to accept these latencies because they come from a legacy of being on satellite connections of many hundreds of milliseconds. They have got used to the internet being poor, but some of them will start to experience good internet, and then they're going to ask us, why is our internet from our particular provider, why is it so poor? And very often it has a lot to do with the latency and how you are routing your traffic from the means of your network. I would like to see a time when traffic between African countries never touches, touches Europe. And it is possible from roughly Nigeria across to Kenya, everything south of that has no reason to go to Europe because coming south will be shorter, will have better latencies, and will have better performance for, for end users. So it is all about user experience. The, the user, you can show them graphs of how fast their internet is. If you can run a 10 gig fiber directly out of your data center in the middle of your, uh, an African country directly to their door, and the user experience will still be poor because of the latency. Users ask how fast is my internet, and you can show them a, a, a report on speed test on net or whatever. And, and prove that you've got the fastest internet, but the page load time of the usable experience is still going to be poor because it still takes six round trips to London to load the first icon on the page, and then another six round trips to London to load the second icon, and another six round trips to London to load the style sheets. And this results in poor, poor web performance for end users. The TCP window and bandwidth delay product is something I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but there is also, due to the way that buffering is done within end hosts, either the server or either the client side, that there 
is a finite limit to how much traffic you can move over a link that has a certain latency. As your latency increases, your maximum possible throughput decreases on a TCP connection. And we've, we've had many users, or many customers of ours who turned up a new 50, 40, 50 meg circuit, and they run a test and they can't understand why they're not getting 40 megahertz to London. And with the latencies as they are, there is no way you're going to get 40 megahertz per second to London on a single TCP download. When you aggregate many customers together, obviously you're going to fill those pipes. But on a single TCP download, you will not get those capacities. And obviously the interactive applications. Many of our web applications are becoming far more interactive. They've got, they've got built-in objects that are providing chat functionality and interaction functionality. Many users are using the internet a lot more for gaming and for, for online voice over IP and that kind of thing that requires this highly responsive, high responsiveness for, for the applications. That requires low latency. Okay. So what we have here, Mozambique is to the east of us a few hundred kilometers, probably not more than 20 to 30 milliseconds latency from where we are right now. Yet our monitoring tells us that it's 190 milliseconds to Mozambique. So what is going on here? This particular ISP actually buys internet from an ISP in South Africa. So it's not like there's no interconnection across the border. The, the interconnection crosses the border. But 200 milliseconds is the same latency that it takes to get to London. You would expect if it was going to London and coming back down, we'd be at 400 milliseconds. So I did some investigation. In this particular case, what is happening is that from a South African perspective, we can see this and we route the shortest path to this ISP in Mozambique. When our packets reach Mozambique, this ISP has not got any routes back towards the South African network operators. They're sending all of their traffic, even though it's destined to, to go straight back across the border, they're sending it all to London, and it's coming back down under the sea cables. So would they give you 400 No, because it's going towards, it's asymptomatic. So it's short one direction. Short one direction, and the return path is the long path. You said it's 160 one direction. No, no, 160 return. So it's 160 up, well, 80 up and 100 down. So it gives you 180 as a round trip going around the continent, getting to us to about the 190. So the, the, the maths are up in sense. But yes, it's, it's, this is also something that is, it's quite important to remember with BGP and peering is that traffic doesn't implicitly flow forwards and backwards on the same path. This is something that you have to engineer your network to do. You have to design it and make sure that its functionality is, is built into your network because it won't necessarily do that on its own. And in that case, it's exactly what's happening. It's going one way for the, the forward path and a completely different route for it. So we have the issue of traffic. <laughs> To some extent, um, uh, my, my experience is that the, the amount of traffic engineering we have been doing is now excessive. We, we have many operators across the continent who still de-aggregate the networks and announce everything as slash 24s. And then divide up the slash 24s to each of the upstream providers, spread the load of their, their traffic. And the added complexity here is a huge challenge. Many people are not maintaining this, this um, de-aggregation properly, and it's getting to the point now where it's causing more challenges than it's worth, and the cost of transit doesn't really make it that useful anymore either. One of the most common errors is that people announce these routes to their transit providers as more specific, they divide them up at their, at their border routes, and then you forget to announce those routes at the ISPs. So anybody who peers with them at the IXP will still prefer to go to London because the route of the IXP is an aggregate that's less preferred. And like I said, many, many people are only thinking about engineering on the international edge. 
If you're someone who's only got one or two internet transit providers, that's fine. Do engineering on your international edge. The moment you get involved in peering or interconnection within your own country, you need to think far more carefully about the way that you configure your network. The other thing for Africa is that ASPOC, the number of ASNs that your BGP message passes through, is the default metric that is used to determine which route is preferred. That's fine when you're in environments where everybody's close by, well connected, low latency paths within a single data center within a single city. When you're in a situation where you have paths of 50, 100, 200 milliseconds, you need something that's going to override that AS path. We have, we have routes, DNS route servers in South Africa that are not reachable by portions of the South African internet community because certain providers choose to prefer, route as, uh, prefer DNS route servers in London for the price of a host of locally. This is bad management, really, and, uh, bad network management, and it's, but it, it is a real challenge to deal with. It's not trivial to make sure that your network doesn't degree. It's by default, BGP will accept everything and will announce everything. You have to be very explicit about what you're not going to let out to your peers when you're designing a network. The other thing that's happening now is that as the internet in Africa is evolving, we're now sitting with a situation where it's getting far more likely that you'll actually learn your customer's routes from one of your peers at the ISP, because your customer may purchase from both you and one of your peers. And there are, the, the challenge with that is that if you're doing very simple filtering, just filtering on the international edge and saying, anything in my customer's network I will accept. You end up in a situation where if you receive your customer's announcer at the ISP, you will then automatically accept it, send it out to your transit link, and your customer doesn't actually pay you for that traffic because the traffic comes into your network over your international transit and then goes to your customer over the field, free peering link, and you're essentially giving away free traffic. <coughs> And this is as a result of the increased complexity that we see. So this, this is where we were in the past. We had, right up at the top there, we had a couple of big international players. Maybe there was a, a large, um, a large uh, national operator that was multi-homed. And then we had the end-user ISP, some of them buying directly internationally, some of them buying from a local operator. And then there was some period happening at these big change points. And it was a very tiered model. Everybody was in one of those classes. This is a bit more like what's going on in Africa. We still have the international players up there, and we still have the national players here, but it's becoming a lot more blurred as to where everybody else sits down here. For example, this guy, he, he's got a good period coordinator. He's negotiated period with that guy, and with that guy, and with that guy. But then this guy is buying from that guy, but that guy is a pair of that guy. So what happens if this guy announces his roots there, they go back to there, and then this guy who sells to him decides to route the traffic that way around. <coughs> Suddenly, Mr. Blue over here is getting free internet. <coughs> so this is where it gets a bit technical, and feel free to ask questions if you're unsure. But some of the things that are working for us in South Africa that may be worth carrying into the other parts of the continent, even some high speeds in South Africa don't get this right away. So partial table, partial table transit is a concept that does exist in other parts of the world, but it's very specific to us where our long haul costs are so much higher than our short haul costs. BGP community strings are how it's played now, and the BGP local prep. So, there's this impression in Africa that you need to either carry full BGP table or you're not going to bother with BGP. And I think that's false. 
That could be the pizza and it doesn't make you a better ISP. The BGP table is filled with useful routes makes you a better ISP. You can quite successfully, we, we, we looked at that list of how many routes there are in Africa. We can quite successfully run an ISP in, in, in Africa with only 10,000 or 20,000 routes in the routing table. And there's still plenty of equipment on the market and in operated in Africa that will support 20,000 routes. If you want equipment that's going to support the full table of half a million routes, you're going to be spending a lot more money. And that, that is a challenge that Af we in Africa face. Spending money on routing hardware is a challenge. But there are ways around it. Only set routes into your network if you are doing partial table that are useful to you. So, from the perspective of a national operator, you want to know about every single other person that is well connected within the country. You don't really need to know what's going on beyond your edge, beyond your international edge. You know that the rest of the internet is there and your transit providers will sort it out. You really don't need to be gathering 447,000 routes. It's not going to be beneficial to your network. Obviously, encourage your peers to aggregate. We, we're past the time where deaggregation is useful to the extent that it's been done in Africa. We need to look at aggregating our analysis and cleaning up what we're doing. And then lastly, always ensure that your local traffic travels the shortest path. In many African countries, the standard is that you have your exchange points where everybody exchanges traffic and you have your international transit. And there's no middle ground. If something happens at the exchange points, everybody routes by the international paths. That's not helpful in this resilience and reliability thing that we're trying to do. Now, the one option is obviously to set up more than one exchange points. The other option is to actually ask your transit provider to make sure that you are routed to the shortest path that they have to that network if your peering path goes away. This is something that we've had in South Africa for many years as a somewhat strange concept of local owned traffic. You can go to a provider in South Africa and you can request local owned internet. They will give you a subset of the BGP feed of routes that they learn within the country and you will be fine all on their international edge from sending traffic. But the first point is that this is cheap cheaper than international transit. The second point is that it provides you with a way to get to people that you're not pairing with. So if someone refuses you pairing at the exchange point, you still have an alternative path to get to other people within your country. Okay, BGP community shift. These are, in a sense, a tag that you apply to your route that you learn. And they're just a simple number. There's some standard in the way that they're laid out, but in general they, they're completely arbitrary. Within your network you're entitled to set them to whatever you like. But this provides a useful way of understanding where your routes are coming into your network and where you want your routes to leave. So when you receive a route from a customer, you currently, many people currently just say, is it within the IP range that belongs to them? Has it been allocated by Afrin correctly? Yes, that's fine. We'll accept the routes. And then we'll let the transit over our international edge. But like the example earlier, we see that same route coming in over the IC. Now what do we do with that route? The way to solve this is with the BGP communities. You apply, when the, when the route is learned over your customer edge, you apply a specific community that marks that, out, that for you. And then on the international edge, when you're building your BGP filters, you specify that only routes that have been learned from that customer edge router are allowed to pass through your international edge. When you, when you do this, you can then look at routes that arrive from your internet exchange points that won't have the correct community on them, and you can avoid having them leak out and giving free transit away to your customers. Now the same thing applies in the opposite direction. When you learn 
routes from the peers and from the transit providers, you want to select. If, for example, you're providing this local only service, you don't want to send the routing table that you get from the international edge to your customers. So by putting communities on your peering links, you can then mark what is a peer and only announce those to your customers. Yeah. Only announce customer routes when the route is actually learned from the customer. Even if it's the same IP, if it's not learned to the customer end router, then you don't want to announce it. Okay. I think that are these presentations going to be online later? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you can get online. Okay. Alright, local preference. Okay, BGP local preference is a weighting that you apply to a BGP route that is only relevant within your local network. So, by default, every route on your local network gets applied at a local preference of 100. If you want to override the preferredness of a route, in any way, you would just set up or down. So, typically what we do on our network is we keep these group, group routes according to cost and distance. Now, cost is obviously financial cost, and distance is, once again, a latency issue. You want to make sure that your, your low latency paths with routes that you learn over low latency peers are preferred over the high latency paths. Something that I also like doing is Prefer paths where you have control. We, we've, we've had incidents in, our, in, in South Africa where large operators break, well, it happens in South Africa and it happens across the whole continent, where large operators do something wrong with their BGP. They black hole traffic, they um, announce traffic internationally where they shouldn't, all of these sort of things. You always want to be in a position where you are, you are in most control of your BGP. The BGP is all related to trust. If you don't trust the party, do you necessarily want to trust the routes that they send you? If you're at an exchange point, you always have a higher level of control over what the traffic is doing because you have your router at the exchange point and you can choose where that route traffic goes. When you're dealing with your upstream provider, you don't always have that level of control. The important thing with local prep, and this, this is something that I've seen people have challenges with, is that because it's something that's carried in your BGP to your whole network, you need to have consistent policy on the whole network. Because if you just arbitrarily decide to push up local prep in one place, and a different engineer decides that they're going to push up local prep by a different amount in another place, you end up with routine inconsistencies. The other interesting thing is that the maximum number for local prep is actually 4.3 million. So I don't know why people insist on using only 100 and 110 and 120. <laughs> so, 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 uh, my personal preference is 100, 200, 300, 400 works for me. Other people might see it differently. But give yourself space to, to, to use these values and to have granularity between that if you have a corner case where something is learned to be exchanged but you learn from a peer that you trust a bit less that you can you have some space to add preferencing between. The important thing here is that this is about when you're learning the same route in multiple places. And that's the whole point of the resilience of the internet. You should be learning your routes in more than one place, be it in multiple exchange points, or be it via multiple links connections, or be it to different transit providers. You want to be learning the same routes in different places and be able to route your traffic over different paths into the failure. So this is this is how we do it on our network. The interesting thing to remember is that your customers are still a peer. They're your cheapest peer because they actually pay you money. Their cost is negative. So your customers should always get the highest local friend. The other important thing to remember there, and this is something that's that is it does it recently, is that if your customers aren't given the highest local preference, then an error on someone else's network can override your customer's routes and cause you to stop announcing your, routes, your customer's routes. Because you learn a 
customer groups from the peer who's got bad, bad configurations, and then suddenly your, now your internal BGP gets suppressed by this um, hijack announcement. Direct peering, direct and private internet, typically these will happen, will, will be arranged and they'll be higher quality and higher capacity links. So typically a, a, a direct private peering is going to be, you, you're going to have better control over it than you do over your IXP peering. So give that a slightly higher local thread. IXP peering obviously once again, this is about cost. Your ISP peering is going to be cheaper than anything else you pay money to get. So these, this, this is a concept from South Africa, so the local, local transit or the, the partial table transit. It's still cheaper than going internationally, but it's not as cheap as the secondary free peering. And then finally, anything that you accept from the global region table. I normally set that up as a default on 100 because it's just easier to work nicely that way. So, in my opinion, it's not just about price. Price is obviously a big factor. We're looking to save money, but I think we're looking to solve technical challenges as well. Using the most expensive equipment doesn't necessarily mean you've got a good network either. We've we, we've experienced many ICs across the continent who buy expensive equipment and plug it in and assume that it's going to solve the networking problem of its own. But you need people to design routing policies and connection policies and, and traffic management schemes to make sure that those, those expensive routers are doing their job. So build your network smart. Analyze where your traffic is coming from. As, as Martin said, it's incredibly important to understand how much of it's coming internationally, how much of it's coming in locally. So, and another thing that we've seen is that, for example, the GGCs that we, we have in Africa and other, other content distribution sources that exist on the continent can on occasion not automatically gather all the traffic within a region. So we have had problems where a particular country will still prefer to fetch its content from London, even though it be directly paired with a content distribution node. Now, if you're not analyzing your traffic flow and understanding where your traffic is coming in and out of your network, you're not going to know this. And once again, root packets are the shortest part. Build your, build your network to provide the best service to your customers. The, 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 the price battle has been ongoing and, and the price of, of transmission services is coming down. The next step for building internet in Africa is going to be improving the quality of our networks. Wherever you can, put extra capacity in be it to the exchange points, be it over private interconnects. If you've got a private interconnect with someone else, put in a gig with Ethernet and not just 100 people. If you've got the opportunity to lay fiber, lay 10. <laughs> design for low latency. So think about the latency aspect when you are designing the locations of your pops, the locations of your routers, and the path that you run. And sometimes it does cost a little bit more. So this goes back all the way to the beginning. We're talking about 63.4 milliseconds to Nairobi. This graph here is of that STM1 that runs from Johannesburg to Nairobi. That was, as you can see, very early in the morning, 7.20 in the morning. We turned up BGP earlier the previous evening. The graph goes up. This snapshot was taken two minutes before we had to shut down the BGP due to congestion. So anybody who tells you that there's no traffic going between South Africa and Nairobi is not aware of what's actually going on. The sad thing about this graph is this is the last time it ever looked like this. That leak is currently doing 200 kilobits per second because the cost of buying the associated services to get this traffic to checks is going to be $10 a minute more than buying traffic to London. So for a 
commercial saving of ten dollars per meg, this meg is sitting idle. So, where we are right now, we're all developing, we're all growing, there's metrics being built, there's metrics being improved. Make sure you're designing your network for quality, because if you don't, someone else is. And then just a couple of guys, BGP monitors, where the BGP information came from, many possibilities as a map, and then smoke ping and cacti, we used to, well, smoke ping is used to create the latency graphs. It's a good idea to do that in your network and find out where your latency is, and in fact, I always look for the, the simple bandwidth graphic. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Graham. Um, do we have questions for Graham? Okay. Um, there's one here. Any other on this side? Okay. I have 
with a V6 terminal to ensure that I've got the best possible latency for V6 as well, rather than hanging out and waiting for their native IPv6 to reach the end of the age. Okay, so the You mentioned it was cheaper to go to London by $10. Yeah. Um, it's, that's not London's fault, that's our fault. Uh, correct? That, 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 that's the cable operator. The cable operator. No, my question is why are we allowing the cable operators to charge us more for a shorter distance than a longer distance? Why are we, are we allowing that to happen? There's a practical challenge there that okay. ca ca cable, in, cable buried in the ground costs more than cable dropped in the ocean. But I agree that this is something that we should be dealing with. Okay. And There's no majority of this cable that's being used by us in the, in the sea. It doesn't matter whether it's in the land or on, in the sea. Why are we losing that revenue? Because we're getting nothing of it, zero. We're, we're being charged to go to London. Where we can take, we can go ten dollars less and still make whatever it is, but we're losing all the revenue. Why are we allowing that? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's it's a market market forces, I would say, and I don't take enough of a view into that. But perhaps someone else could give comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Mohamed from Nigeria. Um, we have the same challenges in Nigeria actually when it comes to the transmission line between, say, Lagos to Abuja. And the distance is roughly about a thousand kilometers, but it's far more expensive than from Lagos to London. So we have providers, some of them like Google, give them free internet access to universities, but you can only take it at the internet exchange point in Lagos. Even though it's free, but the cost of transmission is much higher than the cost of the internet, therefore they cannot tap into the free internet access. Now, what is the problem? I've asked several operators. One of the things is that, yes, it costs more to pay fiber, government are charging for the right of way. Two, is lack of demand, because there is no demand, the price has to be high. If you lay fiber and you want to recoup your investment. If somebody is still buying 10 megs, you want to get your money out of that 10 megs. So I think the operators need to find a way to tap into it, even though it's more expensive, but eventually it will pay off because more people will be running on that fiber and eventually the cost will drop because it's all about um, demand and supply. I think that's that. Yeah, correct. I <coughs> There has been a tendency in the past for traffic exchange locally to account for 5-10% of the total traffic of an internet user in a particular country. The statistics I'm seeing on, on South African networks is that 50% of my traffic that eyeballs are consuming in my networks comes from peering and local, the local service. 50%. It's still not where it should be, but that's a very much better percentage than 10% or 5%. And I agree completely. The reason why some of the cable operators are able to offer the prices that they have is because everybody goes to them with these massive orders. And the guys who are doing local transmission have small orders. And the, the capital costs are the same, so they recover it based on how much it's being utilized on the, on the surface. Thank you very much. I'd like to break this discussion here, this topic for now, because um, it's part of the discussion that will make up the next two days, because this will go beyond the technical and into the policy and business decisions, and we'll have panels that will actually have to sit down and discuss this over the next two days. So, about the terrestrial connectivity, the submarine, what opportunities are there, why it's expensive and so on. So, I like that question that has been asked. I didn't get your name, but still, but please let's ask that question again tomorrow because we have panels uh, that we will sit down to discuss this.
So with that, um, 